So hello everyone and thank you for participating in this new webinar. Uh, we are very happy uh, to share this moment with you, uh, which is the release of our new brain questionnaire. Uh, it's live from some hours now, so when you connect to our application, it's actually the new brain that is available. So this is a new takeoff for us. As for you, and what we want to do today is to explain why we completely renewed this questionnaire, uh, what are the advantages, uh, what are the impacts for those who are already working with us, and uh, also why it is necessary to take into account uh, the reasoning skills of your employees. Before we begin, uh, I will briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Emric. I'm a research psychologist at SS Trust, and I, we, I am with Colm, who is going to, to present himself. Hi guys, hi everyone. So my name is Colm, um, and I'm just looking at the list of participants, and I think most of you already know me. Um, so I obviously work closely with most of you. I've maybe trained a lot of you, and I'm a customer success here at SS Trust. Perfect. Okay, well, let's go. So what are we talking about? Uh, today, technological advancement uh, make work more complex. Uh, most jobs require skills uh, to solve problems that are uh, new and dynamic, and that require both the acquisition and application of new knowledge. So being able to measure uh, the reasoning skills of your employees has therefore never been more important. So when we talk about reasoning capacities or reasoning skills, uh, quite simply, it's an individual's ability to solve complex problems. So his or her ability to understand and respond to the complexity of his work. Many people, uh, whether in research or in popular culture, explain that uh, there are several types of intelligence, which are called specific skills. For example, uh, we have numerical reasoning, uh, verbal reasoning, spatial, uh, auditory, uh, analogical, and Guilford, uh, which was uh, an American psychologist, uh, goes as far as to distinguish uh, more than 100 uh, different forms of intelligence. And it's actually true, uh, we cannot deny it. Uh, there are different forms of, uh, of skills and intelligence. But uh, what we know is that all of these intelligence are all strongly correlated with, uh, with each other and with a general intelligence factor, uh, which, uh, it's, which is called the G factor. So this means that uh, if you can measure this G factor, you will have enough information about a person's ability to succeed in a particular job. And uh, measuring specific skills, in addition, uh, will not provide, not provide more meaningful information. So this G factor is the general ability of uh, someone to, to solve problems. It is composed of two main factors, so the first one is the power, that is to say the level of complexity that a person can manage. For example, simple tasks, uh, intermediate or complex and strategic tasks, uh, the speed, so quite, and, and the speed as the, as the second factor, sorry. Uh, so quite simply, uh, will the person think quickly or be more, uh, be more cautious? Uh, according to a meta-analysis uh, on more than uh, 20,000 studies and uh, 5 million individuals, uh, three researchers concluded that the G factor predicted 25% uh, of the future performance of an employee. So making it the most powerful predictor of success at work. And what we also noticed is that uh, the G factor has a strong positive correlation with a person's learning capacities. So uh, therefore, the more candidate has, to, uh, has a strong cognitive capacities, the more he will acquire new skills. Also with productivity, with the number of promotions he or she will receive during his career, and with the income someone gets. So the problem is that uh, despite these uh, this results, which demonstrate the importance of reasoning skills for, for, for success at work, uh, we are often attempt to bet on other criteria 
and in particular two well-known criteria, so experience, and more recently, emotional intelligence. So what I propose to you to do is to compare uh, the predictive power of the J factor against these two criteria and see uh, from a scientific uh, point of view, uh, which one is doing the best. So regarding experience, uh, the logic will be that someone who has already done the job for 20 years, for example, uh, will be more efficient. And that's why experience is one of the most common recruitment criteria today. Uh, however, uh, John Hunter, uh, a professor of psychology, showed uh, more than 20 years ago now that the J factor is actually three times more predictive of a future performance of an employee than experience. So uh, also a, a more recent meta-analysis analysis, uh, showed that experience has no correlation with success. So in other words, uh, if you recruit someone based on, uh, on his experience, you might as well recruit at random. You would get exactly the same results, but faster. And regarding emotional intelligence, it's a little more complicated to, to compare because it's actually two uh, concepts that do not really fit in, uh, in the same category. So emotional intelligence is the uh, ability uh, of someone to understand, uh, manage, and regulate the, the emotion of, of others. It's therefore not a cognitive capacity, but it, it deals with, uh, it deals more with, uh, with personality dimension. And finally, what we realize is that having a strong emotional intelligence can be great for some jobs, but not for others. If we take uh, two completely different jobs, for example, a nurse and an accountant. So obviously, if a nurse has a strong emotional intelligence, she or he is more likely to be efficient because it's a skill that is required by, by your position, uh, dealing with passion, for example. And on the other hand, uh, for an accounting uh, position, uh, which requires fewer interactions, studies show that having a strong emotional intelligence will be counterproductive. So, however, uh, if reasoning skills are uh, actually extremely important, should we conclude that be smart or die? Be smart or you will never get a job in, in the future. If I can reassure you, uh, not at all, uh, it's not enough to recruit intelligent candidates for them to be efficient and committed. It's actually the adequacy between the job requirements and the, the candidate intellectual capabilities that will be important. Imagine a scale uh, of reasoning skills scored from one to 10, 10 being individuals with strong in intellectual abilities. If for a given job, uh, you're recruiting for, you're expecting, for example, for nine, there will be globally two scenarios. On one hand, uh, the candidate score a 10, for example, so it therefore has a high probability of success because he or she meets the, the expectation. On the contrary, a candidate who score a three will certainly be in difficulty. And we can take exactly the same, uh, the same opposite logic. If you're waiting for a four, a candidate who score a 10 will be less likely to succeed because he will quickly get bored on the job. And a candidate who scores a three will be better a candidate for, for this position because he fits well with, with what you, you're waiting for. So all full reasoning skills are, are important. It is above all the adequacy between the candidate's cognitive abilities and the requirement of, of the job, which will be decisive. And if you don't manage to, to match the two, uh, collaborator will kindly go elsewhere. And this is indeed, uh, there is indeed several studies uh, that show that turnover is much higher if the, uh, this adequacy is not, uh, is not respected. So the big question now is uh, how, yeah, how are you uh, going to assess a candidate's reasoning skills? And spoiler alert, forget the intuition, it doesn't, it doesn't work and will never work. And unfortunately for, for now, until today, reasoning skills do not have uh, 
superb reputation, uh, and recruiters and candidates uh, do not often want to hear about, uh, about them. And this for five major reasons. Uh, first, in general, they are only designed for computers, sometimes uh, even pencil paper, uh, and it's impossible to pass them on mobile. When the half of candidates want to, to apply for a mobile phone, uh, that's embarrassing. Second point, uh, these are generic questionnaires. Uh, you can find the answer on, uh, on internet if you, dig, uh, if you dig well enough. Third, the test difficulty uh, is generic and not adapted for uh, the person taking the test. So it's usually very frustrating as many people may feel that they are, they are failing. Also, uh, it's really long, on average, uh, 30 minutes, up to one hour and a half for some, so which is uh, inconceivable uh, in a recruitment process. And finally, at a time when uh, we are talking about employer branding or uh, candidate experience, for example, uh, well, it's, it's clear that uh, the current reasoning tests are not, uh, not really funny to take. The good news is that today, uh, game-based assessment or gamified assessment address all of these limitations. Several researchers uh, have recently shown that a reliable measure of the G-factor can be obtained using a conventional video game. So you're going to tell me, uh, yeah, it's cool, but it doesn't correspond at all to what an employee will have to do once on the job. I agree, but it's above, above all the, the cognitive function mobilized uh, during this kind of game that are similar to those used in daily work activities. So it's nowadays highly relevant to use these techniques to assess the potential of your, of your candidates. So we will come back uh, to this in more detail later, uh, but gamified assessments have a lot of several things. For example, uh, a reduction in the, in the testing time, also, uh, a reduction in, uh, in anxiety, an increase in commitment and engagement, and also it allows to collect more data points to understand a candidate behavior. And if we add these four points, it gives us cleaner, less biased data, and therefore more reliable results. So of course, the, the goal is not to propose a real game to, to candidate or to pass the, the interviews around a, a PlayStation, but it's to propose them a testing experience which use the same motivational levers as those used in game. So for example, the possibility to breed the response in several stages, uh, rather than a, a simple multiple choice questionnaire, uh, the possibility to adapt the item difficulties based on the candidate's real level, uh, possibility to give them real-time feedback on their behavior, or for example, immerse them in a, in a real scenario. At SS First, we are working on, on this subject for several months now, uh, seeking to to combine candidate experience, gamification, and psychometric validity. And to present this work to you, I will hand over to, to Colm. Perfect, okay. Um, oh, so I'm just going to share my screen. And what we should have said at the start, actually, is as Emmerich was saying, he's, he's been working on this and developing this test over the past, uh, over the past year almost. So it's, it's, it's a big day, I think, for you, Emmerich, and it's, um, I feel like almost we're attending the birth of your first child. <laughs> um, so as you were saying, what does this new brain look like? So um, here is a first glimpse of what we might see on our screen, uh, whether it be telephone or computer. And I've especially chosen the image from a telephone because it was really with that in mind that the test was constructed. Um, so as you can see, the idea is we have this gray image and we have to complete this gray image with the different elements we might find around that image. So all we have to do is slide one of these green elements into the gray image to complete the puzzle. So obviously uh, this one it is quite easy, um, but it was just an example. So to show you another example, uh, what I've done is I've put A, B and C over each one of the elements so you can kind of play along at home. Um, so feel free to write in uh, how you think you would complete this question mark here. And only myself and Emmerich will see the, will see the answer, so you don't have to feel judged. 
Um, so what would you put here in order to complete this image? So we have A, B, and C. Okay, so we have some Bs and we have some, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so I think a lot of people got the idea. So um, we could choose to uh, put our B first of all. However, as a lot of you uh, saw straight away, it's not giving us the exact desired result. Uh, and as a result, we're going to have to go and superimpose another element, which would be our A onto the figure to complete that figure uh, and give us the desired result. So here I'm also going to show you a little bit about the instructions uh, and explain how the instructions were devised. Because when we first did the first tests with our brain, um, we were giving super detailed and long instructions, making sure that person knew exactly what they had to do, what was involved. Uh, and what we realized is that even though the, these people were getting all these detailed instructions, a lot of people were getting it completely wrong. Um, so we realized that a lot of people don't even take the time to read the instructions. So there's no point in having super detailed instructions. And also we wanted to be as fair as possible and not just the people who actually take the time to read the instructions to benefit from that. So we've developed a intelligent way of providing uh, clear instructions that is adapted to each person. So as an example, for those of you who responded directly with B and A, you will never see any type of instructions. You've understood the, the, the problem, you've understood what is needed and you'll move on to the next example. For those of you who just chose B and thought, okay, this looks good, this looks okay, and selected validate, you will receive a first instruction telling you that, okay, well, to complete your answer, you need to add a second item. Um, so then the person will go ahead and if they choose to uh, superimpose the A, perfect, then move on to the next, uh, the next problem. If they're still stuck, they'll receive a, a little bit of a more detailed instruction saying very clearly, you will need to superimpose the A onto the B to complete the desired, um, to give you the desired vigor. So the instructions will be really intelligent and will be really adapted to each person, making sure that everyone has uh, exactly what they need in order to be able to complete the test effectively. We've also included a lot more, uh, I guess, encouraging elements during the test. One of the feedbacks we had from the old brain was that uh, candidates or people in general found it a little bit frustrating. And it was the idea that um, they were answering these questions that seemed to be getting progressively more difficult. Uh, they, were, they didn't know if they were on the right path, if things were going well. So it's just the idea of getting rid of that stress a little bit, encouraging people, letting them, letting them know when they're doing a good job. I'm going to just show you a last example because I want you just to see the different types of problems we could encounter with this new brain. Um, so first of all, you see in this uh, example, in this problem, there's actually two pieces of information we're going to complete. So here we have the question mark above the three and the four. And we also have the question mark here to the left of the 11 and six. And again, I'm going to ask you, uh, firstly, what would you guys put uh, for this question mark above the three and the four? What would you select? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so most of you got it straight away. So we're going to impose the, the seven, first of all. And then if we look here in this question mark, what would we put here? Does anyone have any idea for this one? Yeah, again, okay, perfect. Um, so we're actually going to, again, uh, similar to the last equation, we're going to superimpose two elements. We're going to choose the three and the two in order to give us five. So the reason I wanted to just show this problem um, is because to show you the, the, the range of different strategies that we're going to be asking you to, to solve within the new brain. Um, you know, in, in the first example I showed you, it was very much a, a, an image that you had to complete. It was following the, the, the logic. Here we're presented with a little bit more of a numerical problem. It's a mathematical structure. Uh, so sometimes we're going to play on things like logic. Sometimes we're going to play on mathematical structures. Sometimes we're going to have things like rotations, mirror effects. Um, and what it's allowing is, it's allowing us to use a whole range of different strategies, which will give us a really good diversity amongst the way in which people think. You know, if we have somebody who's really, really stuck 
on a certain type of strategy, it's not a problem because there's so many different strategies within the test that in the next question, it will be a different strategy and will allow them to move forward. And secondly, maybe some of you saw the little bar down the bottom. Um, here, for example, it was green, now it's yellow, now it's orange. <clears throat> so each question does have a limited time. And again, the idea is not at all to, to stress people, uh, you know, to make them feel like they're under, under pressure. It's just so people don't spend too long on, on a specific question. You know, there are people that hate to move on to the next question if they haven't got the answer correct. So it's just saying, you know, don't worry. Uh, it's not a problem. Move on to the next question. It will be a different strategy. It, it will surely be better for you. So we've shown you what the test will look like for the person taking it, but what is the model uh, of scoring behind the test and how have we developed that? And here we've really used the best in terms of technology and also in terms of scoring and psychometrics. So last year, we published an article in the Journal of Intelligence. And the article was explaining all the different ways we could use the different responses in a reasoning test. <clears throat> and I guess just to explain classically, in a reasoning test, we're going to have two different types of answers. We'll have the correct answers and we'll have the incorrect answers, which means we will either get one point or we'll get zero points. And that's, that's the classic scoring system for these types of tests. <clears throat> in this publication, we highlighted the importance of not classifying all incorrect answers as equal. Um, you know, because th there are some incorrect answers that are, <laughs> that are completely incorrect. Um, but there are also some incorrect answers that, you know, they're not 100% correct, but there are certain elements that are correct within those answers. If we think of our first example, you know, those people that maybe just put the B and didn't superimpose the A. So it's not 100% correct, but there are elements of that answer that are, that are, that are correct. Um, and with this new scoring system, those people are not going to leave with anything. They will leave with a number of points, whether it's 40% or 30% or 50%, whatever it may be. So we're really going to create a scoring of uh, a system of scoring that will allow us to use the potential from all the different types of answers that somebody may give us in order to give us a better quality of scoring. And here, just to, just to show you kind of quickly, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but these are all the different types of graphs uh, of information we might have based on the different uh, items that were questioned. And as I said, classically in the scoring system, we'll have two graphs. We'll have one graph for the correct answers. We'll have one graph for the incorrect answers. And here you can see that we have a, lot, a wide range of graphs, lots of different graphs, because there are so many different types of answers that we could give um, with varying degrees of, of quality. And as a result, those answers are going to be qualified very differently in our scoring system. So I've shown you a little bit about what the candidate or what the person will experience taking the test. We've talked a little bit about um, the scoring system behind it. Now I'm going to show you quickly what impact that will have on your Assess First platform, on your Assess First results, uh, on your predictive models that we're creating. So up until today, this was the page that we saw on the Predict Success tab. Um, so we had a score from one to five. Here we can see that in our example, Poppy, for example, has a score of four. And we also see that there are the four subtests. Um, I guess maybe one of the, uh, the advantages of these subtests was that if somebody um, was really struggling uh, with you know, the numerical, for example, possibly it's their abstract that could kind of help them a little bit um, and kind of balance things out. However, there were a lot of limits with this type of scoring system, with this type of structure. Um, you know, for example, if we have somebody in the green here, so who's somebody who's meeting our expectations in terms of aptitudes in this specific predictive model, then this is somebody that's matching 100% with those requirements in terms of aptitudes. However, if we have somebody here in gray, so even though there's only maybe possibly one point in difference in terms of score, this person will directly go down to a 50% match. Uh, and then also the people in red, uh, these people are not matching. And as a result, these people will go down to a 0% match. So it was really lacking, I guess, finesse, you know, just because there was one point in difference that could really change the match between, you know, 50% or 0% or, or, or 100%. So we've really rethought the scoring system to give us a much more reliable um, system. So we've redesigned the scoring, especially in terms of two different changes. So the first change you'll see here 
is we now have a score from one to 10. So Poppy, which we saw previously had a score of four out of five, she'll now pass directly uh, to a nine out of 10. Uh, and the, the other reason that this is quite nice is that it's creating a more fluid experience, harmonious experience on the platform. Because as most of you know, we have a score from one to 10 for the shape. So now uh, brain is in line, it's more fluid with, with the rest of the, the, the questionnaires. And the second thing that we're going to show that is really useful um, is this little graph underneath. So firstly, we can see that Poppy here is in line with our expectations for this job because she's within the green area. So that's the first thing. We know that she's in line with our expectations, which is great. She's matching what I'm looking for for this job. But the second thing is we can see where Poppy positions herself according to the rest of the population. So if we look, we can see that only 4% of the population have a score of nine. So only 4% of the population have a score similar to Poppy. And furthermore, if we look, only 2% of the population actually have a score of 10. So this means that our candidate here, Poppy, not only is she in line with our expectations for the job, but also only 6% of the, of the population uh, have scores similar to, to, to Poppy in the top 6% of the population. And uh, we've also redesigned the aspect in which we're, go we're going to define our expectations. So previously, um, you would have to define your expectations for each one of those four subtests. So we have the, the basic, intermediate, advanced, and expert. And this caused a lot of questions. Um, a lot of people were asking that, you know, it's not clear what the consequences this will have uh, on my matching, on my candidates. Do I need intermediate? Do I need advanced? Do I need expert? If I, me if I choose expert, what, what, will, what will that mean? Um, there was also a lot of problems because people were saying, you know, is numerical more important than verbal, for example? Um, why should I choose verbal instead of numerical? Because mostly today we're looking for skills that are interchangeable or complementary. So again, we've really redefined this system of uh, defining our expectations. And what we've done now is made it much more transparent. So it's going to be much more easy for you to understand uh, exactly what you're looking for. So we still have the same uh, vocabulary. We still have, you know, it doesn't apply basic, intermediate, advanced, or expert. But this time, if I choose basic, for example, I'm going to know that what I'm looking for is anybody with a score of four or above. So this means that 85% of the population are going to match with my expectations for this specific job in this specific um, predictive model. So that's the first thing. Um, and then I, you can see here that the tree is, is in light green. Um, and this means that those people will match, let's say between 60 and 80%. So I know very clearly what percentage of the population I'm going to be going and looking for. You know, likewise, if I choose intermediate, you can see here that I'm going to be looking for the 50% of the population that have this type of score. And again, here in light green, you'll see that 20% of the population with a five will be matching between 60 and 80%. Similarly, advanced, we're going to be looking for the 30% of the population that are matching um, my expectations. And if ever we choose experts, again, we're going to be looking for that 15% of the population that are matching our expectations. Um, and then we're going to be having 70% of the population that are not in line with those expectations for this specific job on this specific model. So I'm going to pass back to Emmerich now to explain a little bit more about the advantages uh, of this new brain. So I think, I think you're still on mute, Emmerich. Sorry for that. <laughs> so what are the advantages? So our brain brings along several advantages. First, it's my screen. Little technical problem, sorry. No. 
would be okay. So first it's adaptive testing. So meaning the test will adapt to the candidate real level and answer. So it allows to reduce the duration of the test. So as you can see on the screen, uh, eight to 12 items are today enough to have a reliable score. Uh, candidate anxiety is also reduced because each candidate have items uh, that are well adapted to his levels and candidates don't feel like failing during all the tests. A big increase also in engagement. So studies show that this type of cognitive assessment uh, are extremely appreciated across, uh, across all generations. Uh, also less cheating behaviors because no one have a, have the same test, so each person has a personal has personalized items or, or questions. So two people from the same company, for example, uh, will not have the same test, and uh, all the, all of that leads to a more reliable reliable results because because data are are cleaner. Second point, uh, brain is more accessible. Uh, it's a mobile first cognitive test, uh, meaning that uh, you can take it wherever you want, uh, even in your bed when you feel comfortable. Uh, half of candidates want to test, uh, want to take tests on mobile, so it's extremely important uh, in your recruitment process. But uh, obviously, you can also take uh, the new brain uh, on a laptop. The test is, uh, as I said earlier, uh, appreciated across genera generations. Uh, our results so show that no matter the, the, age, the age of people, uh, they tend to, to prefer this type of assessments. Uh, it's also more accessible to, to everyone, no matter the, the jobs. Uh, with the older brain, we uh, often had a question about uh, whether the test were, was adapted to people, for example, uh, in industry, etc. Uh, from now on, uh, everyone, uh, no matter the job, uh, will benefit from, uh, from taking the, the brain. And uh, finally, uh, it is way more accessible to disabled people. Uh, as Com showed you, uh, items use really neutral material. So uh, meaning that uh, it's extremely, uh, it's better for people, for example, with uh, dyslexia or daltonia to, uh, to, to work with this material and items. Third advantage, I will let uh, Colm talk about it. So yeah, the, the third advantage uh, is in terms of it being intercultural. Um, so with the old version of Brain, we obviously had sections that were concentrated on verbal, on numerical, um, and this actually required a lot, a lot of work when adapting it to other cultures. Um, you know, to give a, a, an example, I guess, even in terms of verbal, often the, the test will be translated into a different language, um, and obviously in, for tests like reasoning abilities, it's super important that the, the translation is accurate. But we were finding problems off, even if the translation was accurate, maybe within different communities within that culture, the word meant different things. Um, so it just caused a lot of confusion. And as well for things like numerical, we had different cultures that, you know, for certain aspects of the numerical, um, it was functions that they never learned in school or they never really learned in life. And as a result, it was much more difficult for those cultures. And as a result, it was obviously less fair. So um, what we have developed is we've developed a test that is uh, exact, is really intercultural. Um, and today with the new brain, it's available in all of the languages that are available on the platform. So English, Russian, um, anything else you, you might find on, on the platform. And also the... The new brain was taken in all these countries and all, uh, all these languages. And what we found was that the results were really similar um, according to these countries and according to these languages. Um, and I think that's because obviously, as you saw, the only thing we have is that very short piece of, of instruction, that piece of information, except, except that we're concentrating on universal mechanisms. So we're concentrating on mechanisms um, that are intercultural, that won't be impacted by culture, that won't be impacted by, by language. And as a result, it's something that will be adapted or is adapted much more to those cultures. Um, and it's also for this reason, this reason that we didn't include that variable reasoning, you know, as Emmerich mentioned, uh, not only to discriminate against people who may, who may be dyslexic, 
um, but also to avoid that comparison between those different countries um, where some of that language or some of those tasks might not be applicable. As we mentioned, we've had over 8,000 8, people complete the test during our, during our testing phase. And this really allowed us to make sure that we have a solid test from an intercultural point of view. And then I guess the last advantage, uh, and the reason for us choosing this new format of BRAIN is really for the candidate experience. Um, and I say the candidate experience, but of course it's not just candidates for, for, for the general kind of user experience, I guess. And so today, with any doubt, we can definitely say that we have a test that is much more fun, it's much more encouraging for the person, it's less stressful, it's really, really visual, um, and also kind of engaging and challenging uh, for, the, for that user, for that candidate. Because as we said, it's adaptive. So there's never going to be a moment where that person is, sit, is sat there uh, and they are constantly bombarded with uh, really difficult uh, exercises that they can't answer. And at the same time, they'll never be sat there with exercises that are super easy because as soon as they can kind of complete that level, they'll move on to a progressively, a progressively difficult equation. Um, so, you know, in terms of user experience, this will change everything. And I think it's, you know, I think it's normal that in 2020 today, we have an experience that's adapted to each user and it's not just one standard approach. You know, no matter what your ability, no matter what your level, everyone has to do the same test. No, you know, it's going to be adapted. It will be much better for that, for that candidate taking that, taking that um, test. And this was something that was, I think, especially off-putting for people in terms of the old brain. Um, it was that kind of stressful, that frustrating side of, of kind of not wanting to take that test. Um, and, you know, we thought this was a shame when, you know, as Emmerich showed us, the kind of correlation between performance uh, and the importance of, of kind of evaluating the reasoning abilities. Um, and that's why we kind of really wanted to change up that experience for those candidates or for those users as well. Um, and I guess the, uh, maybe the last thing that I just really want to, to kind of be clear about as well, and Emmerich touched on it, is that, I, you know, I don't want anybody going away today thinking, okay, you know, great, they developed a game, it looks great. Um, you know, we really worked well, the guys really worked, Emmerich and, and the team really worked on, you know, ensuring that, you know, it's, it's, it's super reliable and that there is a difference between a game and, and a test. Um, you know, this type of gamified test, it's not just a game that we develop that will test reasoning abilities, um, but it's really a, a reasoning, a test uh, that we've developed using gamified aspects to improve that experience for the candidate or for the user. So the objective remains exactly the same, you know, it's to provide you with the most reliable, with the most effective information about the reasoning abilities. And, you know, we've spent a long time looking at everything else that's available on the market, all the other reasoning tests, of course, you know, we've evaluated everything that's out there. And there's a lot of reasoning tests out there that are great and super interactive for the candidate. However, from the point of view, you know, reliability and providing you with kind of really effective and reliable results, it wasn't really kind of it wasn't really kind of reliable or effective there and that's definitely something that we were looking to avoid with this test so there we go for the big changes in this brain and the kind of reason for these changes um if anybody has any questions feel free to to type in into the comment section now and we will kind of get to any questions that people may have already we have we've had just one or two um and the first one is in terms of predictive models. So somebody's asking what will happen to their current predictive models uh, on the platform. So um, we mentioned it earlier, but just for you to know, absolutely you have nothing to do uh, on the platform. Any predictive models that you have already will be given an equivalent with the new brain. So if you log on even now, you'll see that the predictive models are just there and the scores have been transferred from the old brain to be given an, an equivalent um, for this new brain in, in this new scoring system. We, we also have question about whether or not you, you have to recheck the, the new brain. So for people who took the older brain recently, it's not necessary to, to take the new one, but I highly encourage you to, to, take, to take the test. Everybody can, can do it to, uh, to feel what the, the new experience is looking like. And as we were saying, you know, the new brain on average takes between eight and 12 minutes. So it's really quick and really fast. So yeah, you, you should definitely go and try it out. Um, a kind of a similar question. We have people asking if the old brain will still be uh, accessible and the old reports on the platform. So from this morning, uh, it's no longer possible to take the old brain. 
if you want to take brain, it will be the, the, the new, uh, new and improved brain um, and also the, the new reports. Um, but as we, as we said, the reports really haven't changed very much um, except for those subtests that numerical, that variable, that abstract, the reports are still really, really similar. You have your global score, uh, you'll have your learning style, your approach, the risk factors. Um, so if you go onto the platform today and have a look, you'll see that there's not many changes in those reports. We've tried to give everything an, an equivalence, an equivalence, sorry. Do we have any other questions? We also have a question, how do you, you, do you minimize the learning effects? For example, because uh, this is a time tap of uh, a reasoning. So for example, a candidate can, uh, can train online, for example. Uh, we mean, it's, it's really uh, minimized because we just show you some, uh, some items, but we have uh, a lot of different type of, of strategy of items, different levels. So uh, the learning effect is, uh, is lesser on, uh, on the new brain uh, than on, uh, on the older. We also have a question uh, about will people who, uh, people who are used to playing games, people who are gamers, will they benefit from this type of test? I think maybe, Eric, you, you talked about this a second ago, maybe you'll be able to say more. Um, but no, it's, it's using gamified aspects, but it doesn't mean that people who are, who are used to playing games will, will do better. Uh, not at all. It's just, it's just taking aspects to make it more gamified, but it's not kind of, nobody will be benefiting from, from, from that just because of the fact that they, they like to play games. And... Oops. I think we will also have a question uh, asking when do, do the test uh, start to adapt to, to a personal level? So obviously uh, the first item to everyone will be uh, an item of medium difficulty uh, because we don't know yet the, the, the exact level of someone uh, starting the test. And uh, after the, the first items, uh, after the, the candidate uh, give his first response, the first answer, uh, the test will start to, to adapt to his level. And also, I guess that's a good point, not, not for anybody to think that if you get one question wrong, then that's it, you know, you, you've, you've ruined it. Um, if, if you get one question incorrect, it will adapt, but it will give you the chance to go back up within those questions. So it will be adaptive along the whole process. Um, and we have a question, is it a predictor of the capacity of people to navigate in the new world, for example, learning new skills, new competencies? Um, and how does it transfer in predicting the success? So that's exactly what this new brain is. Um, as we mentioned earlier, you know, there's, there's less this idea of uh, numerical is important and abstract is important, but it's really kind of um, everything is complementary and everything is interchangeable. And then it's really this type of intelligence that we're looking for in this new world, in these jobs that possibly never existed, for example, of people that can learn really quickly, that can adapt, that can evolve, and that can learn those new skills. Um, and as Emmerich showed us at the, at the very start of the presentation, this uh, G factor can, can predict 25% of somebody's performance in a job. A new question, uh, an Italian version of instruction is available or it's still to be developed. Uh, so as Condor said, uh, Brain is re actually released in, uh, in all languages. So uh, I know Italian is, uh, is perfect from uh, instruction to, to, to the test himself. So all, all of the instructions are, are available in Italian. And as we saw, those instructions are really quite, quite short and, and precise so all the languages should be available from today there's no problem i think that's it uh, can we use it to, to prevent discrimination uh, obviously it's uh, it's also one of our first goals uh, because uh, 
people or recruiter, or as I said earlier, uh, some of them today tend to recruit exclusively on, uh, on experience, for example. Uh, but we know that uh, people with, uh, with much higher social background, for example, uh, have access to, uh, to better studies, for example. So uh, recruiting uh, an experience actually leads to, uh, to more discrimination. Uh, on the contrary, recruiting on reasoning skills, for example, or, or personality and motivation, because all of these factors as, are, are equally uh, distributed on, uh, on the population. Uh, whether your ethnicity, your age, your sex, gender, etc. So uh, recruiting on a potential or behavioral factor like reasoning skills uh, will lead to less discrimination and actually much more diversity. If I take our example at Assess Trust, uh, exclusively recruiting on, uh, on these three factors, uh, I know that our talent acquisition manager uh, doesn't look at all at, uh, at Resume, for example. And uh, we can see in our workforce that uh, we, are, we are highly, highly uh, diverse. For example, uh, our CTO is uh, an old male man. Uh, I don't know if it's the right term in English. Correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we also have a uh, dancer, so also people that uh, was working in uh, in bank. So uh, so so yeah, recruiting on reasoning skills will lead to to less discrimination. Yeah, and I guess as you as you were saying, Emmerich, there's there's certain uh, educational institutions that um, really concentrate on preparing people for reasoning tests. Um, and as a result, those kind of students or those people in, in those institutes will go through rigorous um, tests and preparation for, for, for those reasoning abilities, which makes it, you know, slightly uh, less fair for people who maybe didn't have the, the, the possibilities to go to these institutions. Um, whereas this new kind of test, uh, this new, with this new brain, first of all, it's, it's kind of a new, uh, it's a new concept. It's not something we've seen a lot but also it's something that's incredibly difficult to, to prepare. There's no way you can kind of cheat it or, or prepare for this type of test. We also have a question uh, asking whether it's uh, not uh, difficult to let people see uh, their score across the population on the, on the graph uh, column show earlier. For example, if you have a one uh, out of 10, uh, it, can be, it can be really frustrating. So, uh, what you, you need to know is that candidates do not have access to, to their score on 10. Uh, they just see uh, their learning style, uh, whether they take decision rapidly or, or not. They also see uh, the type of task uh, that are the best suited for them. So uh, all of the information we are presenting to, to candidates are, uh, are positively, positively uh, positively written, if I can say. So, uh, so, so it's perfect by that and, and candidates do not have access to, to, their, to their precise score. Yeah, again, you know, as always with Assess First, nothing negative will ever be communi communicated to the candidates. They'll never have any sort of matching, any percentage, any score, you know, we, we will never give them that information. They'll always have quite positive summaries of, 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 of their abilities, whether that be personality, motivations or, or reasoning. Um, Can we use it to predict the capacity of people to work <laughs> from successfully? So obviously, uh, we, we created a, a model you can find out the, the application uh, called the remote worker, if I'm not wrong, uh, yeah. that, uh, that isolates the, the dimension on a shape, on a drive and a, on brain uh, that are, that are that are necessary to, to people uh, for them to succeed in, a, in remote jobs or, uh, or actually if, uh, because of the coronavirus. So you can find the, the model on the application and it's, uh, it's really, really reliable. And I think we just have one last question. Um, we're in the middle of a project and some candidates had not completed the brain assessment before the changes. Uh, will there be a significant difference in the results? If so, how do we keep it uniform? 
so once again, just for nobody to, to worry about anything, uh, obviously, you know, after this webinar, I'm available if, if we need to set up a call, but just to explain, nobody has to worry about anything. And in reality, um, there's, there's kind of nothing for, for anybody to do. Um, and in this specific uh, context, you know, those people who hadn't completed the brain, that, that's no problem. They're going to go and they're going to complete the new brain. And those people who had already completed the, the old version of brain, again, that's absolutely no problem. They'll be given an equivalent score um, with the new brain that's exactly reliable as the old score was. It'll be transferred over. You have nothing to do. Those people, those candidates can continue on uh, taking the new brain or the people who had already taken the brain, that, that's perfectly fine. Again, there's nothing for you to do. Everything will be automatically transferred and given an equivalent uh, in, this new, in this new version. Yeah, also all the, the documents you add on the older brain, for example, uh, the interpretation, interpretation guide uh, of the documents are uh, were adapted and will be sent to you uh, this week, I, uh, I think. Yeah. So I think that's it. I think we've answered all the questions. Yeah. As I said, uh, most of you know me already, so feel free to send me a quick mail if we need to set up another call, or if we need to kind of go into more detail. And otherwise, thank you all for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Bye. Bye, bye-bye.